Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Good morning. In all our rooms, we're really glad that you're here at FaithBridge. Uh, Wherever you are in your faith journey, uh, um, we're glad that you're here today. So, uh, we're going to continue on in this series that we've been doing on the life of David. And, oh my, this is the day we come to um, one of David's greatest struggles, temptation. Particularly sexual temptation. Uh, up to this point, he has been a shining example of faithfulness, of loyalty, of bravery, of courage, of godliness, but not today, not this time. We're going to go to 2 Samuel 11 and see what we can learn from him. And if uh, while they're passing out the Bibles, you need a Bible, why don't you just raise your hand, and they'll be glad to let you borrow uh, one of the Bibles. You can keep it if you need. Um, in all of our rooms, the ushers are coming now to do that. If you didn't bring a Bible and you want to follow along, 2 Samuel 11. And I should mention, this message won't be R-rated, but it will be PG-13 rated. And if that's more than you bargain for, this is a great chance. While people are moving around in the aisles, maybe you slip out and take advantage of our awesome kids' ministry. And you can slip back in here in about five minutes and, and uh, off we'll go. So... Um, Deborah Hirsch writes in one of her books about a teenage boy who I think put it very well when he said, I've invited Jesus into my heart, and that part was easy. The real challenge for me is to figure out how do I get him invited into my privates? And you can laugh at that because it is funny, and I think it uh, communicates precisely what many a Christian wrestles with. Um, in fact, I'd go so far as to say that there are many people today who have trusted in Christ, who've given their lives over to Jesus Christ, but because of their thought life, because of temptations, and particularly sexual temptations uh, that befall them, if we could see their life with spiritual eyes, we would see that their lives, your lives, our lives, look a lot like the houses up and down the neighborhoods that were hit by the floods with stacks of junk and, and furniture and drywall sitting out there and just trying to figure out how do I get rid of this? But God never created any of us to have souls that looked like that or felt like that. He created us to have life, the more abundant life, a joyful life, a free, liberated, fulfilling sort of life. That's what he created us for that we might flourish. The devil has always been about stealing and kill, killing and destroying though. And that's what we're gonna see today. Not much has changed in 3,000 years. King David, though he lived way back then, is a whole like we still are today. All right, so uh, why don't we jump in. Uh, 2 Samuel 11 in the Old Testament. Oh, and let me orient you, just since we've moved around a little bit in this series. At this point in David's life, he's about 50 years old. He's no longer a shepherd boy, a teenager sort of thing when he was being anointed for king. No, no, now he has become the king. He has been the king and a very successful king um, of Israel for about 20 years. He's roughly 50. 2 Samuel 11 verse 1. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army, and they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Now let's stop there. I think that's kind of an interesting way for the story to start, isn't it? It says, in the spring, the time of the year when the kings would normally go off to war, David stayed in Jerusalem. See, at springtime, the ground was firm. Any snow or moisture is melted. The chariot wheels could roll again. This is the time when if you're the king, you get out, you lead your troops. This time, 
His 20th year, he said, no, I think I'll just sit back this time. Why do you think he sat back? I've pondered that myself a little bit. Wondered if maybe he just thought, you know, I don't know if I have the energy like I used to have. Maybe he looked in the mirror more often than normal and noticed, you know, there's, there's a lot more salt than there is pepper up there. Maybe he had nothing and said, you know, that real gain, it doesn't work. <laughs> Not that I would know. I'm just imagining what <laughs> David might have said. Maybe he was thinking to himself, you know, I, I wonder if I've lost a step. Do I still have what it takes to be the man? But for whatever, whatever reason, in the springtime when kings normally went off to war, David remained in Jerusalem. Let's keep going. Verse 2, one evening, David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. Now, what's going on here? You've got what I remember Ben Stewart saying years ago. You've got a good case here of two people who are in the wrong place at the wrong time. You've got David, who should have been out to war, and you've got Bathsheba, who should have been behind a shower curtain. Two people at the wrong place at the wrong time. And really, you know, many times temptation comes to us for no reason more than we find ourselves at the wrong place at the wrong time. Like, maybe at work. You know, you have to work late and... and you go to get some coffee in the break room or some water at the water cooler, and you find out she, she had to work late, too. And That's kind of weird. Nobody else is here. It's just the two of us. Hey, well, you, you want to get some dinner together? Might be the wrong place at the wrong time. Or maybe at home when everybody else has gone to bed, but you're like, eh, I think I'll just stay and watch some TV see what's on from channel to channel, or go online on my iPad or my iPhone. Wrong place at the wrong time. Or maybe you're dating somebody, and maybe it's just one of those nights when you're sitting around kind of having a Netflix night, and it's late, and you know you're just one roll away from trouble. Wrong place at the wrong time. Jesus said an interesting thing in Matthew 26. He said, watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. Why? Because the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. So you got to watch and you got to pray. I mean, this is active. This is proactive. This is not just responsive, right? We got to stay on our guard. How do you do that? Well, you got to figure out how you do that for you because you're wired in a different way than the next person than the next. I have a friend who told me, who I know what his struggles are, but he said, you know what, I've just, I've just had to learn there's several different routes I could take to get home, but I've had to learn I cannot drive on that road. I can't go home that way. Yeah, how come? Because it always puts me in the wrong place at the wrong time. I just can't, I just don't drive that road being watchful. You know? Or another who says, I just don't stay up and just keep watching TV and, or iPad or iPhone and when everybody's gone to bed, you know, maybe if I can't sleep, I'll, I'll read. I'll read a book, but I'm just, I'm just not going to do all that other stuff. Wrong place at the wrong time. I remember when Suzanne and I first got married, we just said, you know what? It would be healthy for us, not to be legalistic, but we just kind of felt good about saying to each other, I'm not going to take lunches or coffees, you know, with opposite gender people. Not friends, not for work. You're like, why? Because you're like so holy? No, because we're both so human. And we both just realize, you know, if, if I'm sitting across the table from somebody who I feel just the slightest bit of attraction and chemistry for and there's a little energy, nothing terrible is going to happen, not one time. No, but the problem is, you go back and you say, yeah, that was kind of fun. I, I might do that again. I mean, we got a little work done, and it kind of felt good. It's the second time and the third time and the on and the on and the on time. Wrong place at the wrong time. 
And for that reason, we just said, you know what? It'll probably just be best if we just don't do that. Then we don't put ourselves, we're just trying to be watchful and prayerful. Because see, I've never met anybody who meant to get their, their wires crossed with another person, their roles confused with another person, or to have conversations that they should really have only been having with their spouses, and now it's destroying their marriage. I never found anybody who said, that's my goal in the next three years to make that happen. No, but if you rewound the tape, you would go back and you would find there was one point in time where you ended up at the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's the problem. So forethought is forearmed against flirtation, foreplay, and other dangerous things. Be watchful and prayerful, Jesus said. (coughs) David was not being. Verse 2 again. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Now, you know that this servant standing by David, he's watched him operate among women before. He's like, uh, King Here's who her father is, and here is who her husband is. Husband, his name is Uriah, and that's one of your 37 mighty men. You remember that? But somehow in that moment, David just saw himself as a little above all that. And verse 4 says, then he sent David, David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him and slept with her, and she purified herself from uncleanness, and then she went back home. Mark this down, friends. You cannot start to feed the appetite of lust just a little bit and expect that'll be enough. It'll just go away. It's like drinking salt water. The more you drink it, the thirstier you grow. Just one more drink, and that'll be enough. Just, just one more talk, just one more touch, just one more moment, one more affair. See, lust is progressive. If you crack the door open, it's not going to just be a little crack. It's going to go more and more and more open. Now, here's the thing. When you're reading the story, if you've never read the life of David here in the chapters of the Bible, which you really ought to do because it's a fascinating story, but you get to this point, you're like, what in the world? How did this happen? It's just like he slipped so suddenly. No, it wasn't sudden at all, and I'll prove it to you. If you went back to 2 Samuel 5.13, you would discover that David, after he'd become king, he took more wives and concubines. So David, he's building a little harem of women along the side. Why? Because God had given special permission to the kings and said, hey, everybody else gets one spouse, but the king, you can have a lot. No, quite the contrary. In Deuteronomy 17, he had said, no, you can't, even if you are the king. I don't want you going for more gold and more horses and more women, money, sex, and power. That's really what it is, because I'll provide for you everything that you need. See, David was the first king of Israel to bring polygamy into the palace. And God had said, that's not the way I intended for things to work. Because if you don't have exclusivity with one person to whom you're married of the opposite gender, you cannot have that safety and trust that our souls require for equilibrium. And so why did he have so many wives and concubines? I'll tell you why. Because somewhere along the way, he cracked open the door to a thought that led to a feeling that led to an action. And that's always the progression. Your thoughts lead to your feelings, which lead to an action. And he did it one time. But nothing terrible happened, and so he's like, well, One time, two times, what's the difference? And he did it again. The sky didn't fall in. He's like, well, you know, maybe one more time and another and another. And maybe finally he said to himself, you know what? I've probably done enough of this. I've probably got enough wives and concubines. This is is the last time. I'm never going to do that again. Maybe he had one of those kind of conversations with himself along the way. But it didn't take because here he was again. Bathsheba, (laughs) she wasn't the first. 
She was this latest. So should he have fought those impulses? Should he have fought that temptation? No. No? Yeah, no. See, the interesting thing about uh, temptation in the Bible, we're never called to fight temptation. 1 Corinthians uh, 6.18 tells us, flee. That's the word you're looking for, not fight. You won't win. If you get tangling with temptation, you'll never win. You gotta flee. Flee from sexual immorality. Sort of like Joseph did. You remember back in Genesis 39? Joseph, the guy who had the coat of many colors and, and who was sold off to slavery by his brothers who were envious and who hated him, and he ends up in Egypt, and he's, and he's wondering what in the world's going on, and, and he ends up being a slave to, to this guy named Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife, she's like, hey, Joseph, you're pretty good looking. And so she's making some overtures at Joseph, and he's, he's like, hey, you know what? No, no, you're married, and I'm, I'm just doing my, my slave job here. You know what I mean? Just keep doing the chores. I got to do it. Finally, she came to him. She grabbed him. She said, sleep with me. And as she was taking his, tearing his shirt off, he's like squirmed out and he runs off. And that was a good move. You say, yeah, but that kind of a little awkward. Yeah, it is awkward. But he preserved his integrity and preserved the health of his soul because of that choice. Um, wifely. Because God doesn't want you to enjoy the better things in life? No, quite the contrary. Because God does want you to enjoy life to the full. He says trying to protect you from what the devil is making enticing that will destroy. Why? Because he's always been about killing and stealing and destroying. Let me just ask you the question. I mean, let's just get very practical here. Has sex outside of marriage ever made life better for you overall? Or has it maybe just made life a little bit more complicated? I know the answer to that without your even answering. So you run, you flee, get out, don't look back. Don't rationalize. Don't try to convince yourself. Oh, it's really not that, you know, no, no. just like a house that's on fire, you get out. You need to move. Sure, you might look a little silly or you feel like you look a little silly, but at least you'll be a whole person emotionally held intact by your character. And that is better. Proverbs 6, 27 says, can a man scoop fire onto his lap without his clothes being burned? No. Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? No. Obviously. So break it off. Flee. Why? Because it's a lot easier to squash the acorn on the sidewalk than to try to chop down the big oak tree someday that it became. I remember uh, years ago, before starting Faith Bridge, I was um, at the church in the woodlands where I was, and a guy came in to talk, and he, 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 I said, what's up? And he says, well, I'm in a little bit of a pickle. I've kind of got a problem. Okay, what is it? He says, well, um, see, my wife and I, we're really good friends with our next door neighbors, and we do stuff together, and, and she's really awesome. Your wife? No, the spouse. Oh, okay. And like she's really pretty and she's really caring and just encouraging and and anyhow we we yesterday we were uh, just kind of we we're out in the backyard and just kind of doing some work and one thing and another and and he said we ended up making out i'm thinking to myself well, that gives new meaning to yard work I, I didn't say that, but I mean, I'm just thinking, wow, you know, and, and so, um, and he said, it, it, that's all we did. I mean, that, that, so finally, we were just like, what are we, and so we like went back into our houses, and, and he said, um, so that's, that's like where it stopped. I'm like, okay. I said, so, uh, like, what's next? He said, well, see, that's, that's why I'm here, because I know that we would have both been happy to continue going along. 
I said, yeah, so, so what's your plan? And he said, I guess uh, to, I'm going to have to use a lot of willpower. I said, eh, I don't think that's the answer. I think that's pretty stupid, actually. I, I, I'm not the most Rogerian counselor. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I said, that, that, you've already told me where this story is going to go, and it's not a happy ending. You've already played it forward for me. What do you mean you're going to use willpower? And, and he said, uh, well, so, like, I don't know, maybe do you think we ought to, like, I should just, we should move? I said, sounds like about the smartest thing you've said so far here in my office. If they're not moving, you better get moving, right? Because I don't know how you're going to flee otherwise. He said, oh my gosh, that's like huge. I'm like, yeah, but play it forward. You've already told me where this is going to go. And, and, and think of the, the, the compromising of your integrity and the, and the sacrificing of your family and your kids. Is that really what you want? He said, no, that's not what I want. And I said, well, let me pray for you. And so I prayed for him and out from my office he went. And honestly, I really didn't think he was going to be man enough to do it. I thought, yeah, next time I see you, it'll be because it's all come apart. But to my pleasant surprise, he went home, put a for sale sign up in his house. And a month or two later, they were, they were in a different place. And I ran into him a while back. And... He said, you remember that time that I came? I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that time when you came in my office. He said, you know, I got to tell you, I hated that hour of my life sitting in your office talking about that. He said, but it led to one of the wisest decisions I ever made in my life. He said, I know. And that's what I want for you. Every one of you. You may need to flee more aggressively than you've been considering lately. Jesus said, you've got to watch and pray. Why? Because the spirit may be willing, but your flesh is weak. Let's be realistic about this. Ladies, I, I, I'm going to trust this goes without saying, but this, this isn't just a sermon for men, right? Right? Uh, the reality is, regardless of our gender, all of us have the propensity to be tempted and lured to certain things, regardless of whether you're a male or a female, okay? So for just a moment, let's just, let's just be metaphorical. Um, and let's just say David represents the human heart. Every one of our human hearts is David, we're all depraved. We're all infected with sin. There's not one, no, not one, who, who doesn't wrestle, the Bible says, with this sin, with this depravity, with temptation that, that comes into our heart. Let's just assume for the moment that Bathsheba represents uh, temptation. David represents the heart. Bathsheba represents temptation. You're David, and I don't know what your Bathsheba is, but I know you've got one. You may get two or three. And see, now, sometimes those things are different from gender to gender. You know, for some people, that your, your Bathsheba might be pornography. And you find yourself, says, I just really want to go and look at the, you know, and, they, and other people are like, I, that doesn't even. But some of you, you might be, your Bathsheba might be sort of the romantic chick flicks where you can sort of get your mind engaged in sort of, a, or Fifty Shades of Grey. Or so, so see, everybody has their own forms of temptation that are working on them, but let's not pretend that this is just something that, that one gender uh, has to wrestle with. All of us have to wrestle with this, right? So the question is, will you be honest enough to admit Here's what I struggle with, and then will you take the steps you need to take to flee?
You say, well, all right, this is great, and I needed this, and the problem is I needed it like a year ago or five years ago or 15 years ago. You know, he's kind of getting me a little bit late here, Ken. So what do you got for me? What do you do, you know, if you've broken it all, sexually speaking? Well, I hope you wouldn't do what David did, at least not at first. We didn't have time to read it, but I'll summarize it for you. Initially, what does David do? He covers it up. He hid it. He never told a soul. And then to cover up the adultery with Bathsheba, he has to compound things by doing some more sins involving some lies and and ultimately arranging for the murder of Uriah, her husband. And he still keeps it all covered up. He keeps it all secretive. Never tells a soul. And roughly a year goes by before finally God sends a loving friend to him called Nathan. And Nathan comes in to David and says, hey, David, I'll tell you this story. Which, by the way, this is a really good way to do confrontation. Nathan knew something that we could probably all benefit from learning. He goes to a story. He just makes up a story. He says, hey, David, there was once in the kingdom... There's this guy, you need to know about this king. There's this guy and um, he had everything. He's, he has, he's rich, he's got all these animals, he's got all this wealth, he's got anything he wants. And then there's this other guy in the kingdom and he's poor and he's got nothing except this one little sheep but he loves that little sheep and he takes care of that little sheep and he feeds that little sheep. And then one day, the rich guy, he was having a big party and he needed some meat to eat. And so instead of going for one of his many animals, he arranged for that sheep or that one man to get taken. And he took that one sheep and he grilled it up and he served it just for fun. David, what do you think of that? And at hearing that story, David stood up and he said, that man should die today. At which point, Nathan leaned over and said, David, you are that man. You had everything. You had everything anybody could ever want and more. You're the king. And God had even told you, if you ever want more, I'll just provide it. I'll give it to you. But that wasn't enough for you, huh? You had to go to somebody else's and you had to take what wasn't yours. And you should have never known or had spiritual knowledge or awareness about a woman who didn't belong to you. But you went and you got that. I'm talking about you, David. And at that point, David finally did the right thing. He owned it. He didn't hide. He didn't bow up and say, who do you think you are to tell? He didn't make excuses. He just said, I've sinned. I've sinned against the Lord. He confessed it. You know, that's a really good thing to get to a point of confessing it. You know why? Because it's only through confession that the doors to grace are thrown wide open to us. See, as long as we're locking it down and keeping it in and being secretive, the grace can't flow in. And so we carry all of this stuff and it makes our souls to feel like junk piles and our energy is depleted and we're withering on the inside. But if we confess and just be honest, the doors to grace open up and at this point he receives grace. Nathan looks at him and says, David, you're not gonna die. God forgives you. By God's grace, you're going to be able to move on from this. Here's the interesting thing about the Bible, the wonderful thing about the Bible. The point of the Bible is that God continually, persistently works with and gives grace to people who don't deserve it. (laughs) That's the Bible right there. He gives grace to people who don't deserve it. And that's exactly what happens here. Now, will there be consequences? 
for his sin? Will there be some ramifications? Yeah, there'll be some complications as a matter of fact. But God, nonetheless, is going to give David a glorious future. He's going to restore him. He's going to let him lead the kingdom. He's going to set up the next generation to succeed. And so here's the reality for you. And I want you to make sure to get this loud and clear. I don't know what you've done sexually, okay? The truth is, though, no matter how mild it is, no matter how damnable it is, there's forgiveness for you. And we know that this is truth. Grace, forgiveness, hope, we know it's true. Why? Because Romans 5.8 tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's the gospel. We know that there's grace for us because God didn't stay aloof and look at us in our shame and in our filth. He said, instead, I'm going to send my son who will live the perfect life that you couldn't live. And then he will die the death of punishment that you deserve, that you earned. But he's going to take the hit for you. He's going to go to the cross and pay the price for your sins. And then he's going to rise victorious. And that's going to signify to anybody who links themselves to him through faith that you too can live full of life. You can live with a heart full of hope and the assurance that no matter how bad it's gotten, you can be forgiven. You can move forward from this point. But so many people, they don't know this good news. And subsequently, after messing up sexually, they're just like, I might as well just shoot the other tires out because I already got a flat or two. No, stop. Don't let the devil convince you of that. You could change by God's grace. You could come back to the life that he has in mind for you. How's that going to happen? By confessing. It starts with confession. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins to the Lord, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It starts by confession. But notice, David also had a good and a trusted, loving friend, Nathan, who came to him. I think that's worth pointing out as well. You, you, it's, yes, confession is the first step, but you also got to have another person because confession leads to forgiveness, but it doesn't bring healing. What brings healing? Other people whose whites of the eyes we can look into who can say to us, in the name of Christ, you're forgiven. Healing comes through other followers of Christ putting their hands on you and blessing you. That's where the healing comes from. That's why James 5.16 says, confess your sins one to another so that you might be healed. And so um, healing from the struggles, from the addictions, from the wounds, the healing isn't going to come just primarily from talking to God about it. The forgiveness comes that way. But then you got to talk about it with somebody else. You say, okay, what do you have in mind? I got two things in mind for you as we come towards the end. The first one is this Kairos weekend that we saw the video about. See, um, you know how it is in springtime when the breeze is cool and it just feels good and you just kind of feel this energy and you're just like, you know, look at our garage. It's just full of this junk and, and you throw open the garage and you start taking the junk out and you say, this stuff needs to go in trash. This stuff needs to go to Salvation Army and, you know, let's organize this. And it, it just, you just a spring cleaning thing and you throw open the windows of the house and the cool breeze blows through. Our souls are kind of like houses. From time to time, they need a spring cleaning. Why? Because you got junk inside your souls that you've picked up. And I'm not just talking about sexual junk, although I'm certainly talking about that. But maybe you've, you've got other stuff, greed sorts of junk, pride sorts of junk, envy sorts of junk, other kind of junks that have gotten inside your souls. This is the great thing about the Kairos weekend. It's like a spring cleaning for the soul where you can just come and say, you know what, I just gotta get, I gotta get freed up from this. Like Roger was talking about in the video where you can stand tall and walk out and say, you know what, that is who I was, but it's not who I am now. Nope, not by God's grace. 
I want you to come and be a part of the Kairos weekend. It's October 20th and 21st. All you got to do is just go on the app or go online, faithbridge.org slash kairos. Kairos is just a word that means a moment in time. A moment in time. I don't want you to miss that moment in time. It's for you. But here's the thing. You need more than a moment in time for ongoing health, for ongoing victory. You also need a Nathan, maybe two in your life. Somebody of the, of the same gender that you can just be transparent, totally transparent, not like, yeah, you know, let's talk about the Texans. No, no, but like, here's really what I'm wrestling with. And here's what I'm wanting to do. Here's where I'm feeling tempted. I need you to pray for me. And where you can just turn on the lights of your soul and let the cobwebs be seen so that you can together sweep them out. You say, well, I... I do need that kind of friend, but where would I get that sort of friend? I would say, why don't you start by looking in your grow group? I bet in your grow group, there's probably a certain person, maybe two, that you just extra kind of click well with. Maybe you got the same kind of humor. What if you just said, hey, you know, what if we just, you want to maybe have breakfast once a week before work or some other such time that could work with your schedules and, and we'll just like be transparent with each other. Pray for each other and encourage each other all the more from the attacks of the devil. I'm telling you, there's nothing like that. I've told you this story before of Pastor Dan and my, our, our professor, who she's 25 years ago now, such a brilliant professor in seminary. It just every time he opened the Bible, he would just teach us. He it was just, it's magnificent. We would take notes and just hang on his every word, and it was just it's powerful. Years after we graduated, Dan and I, we were here, and we were working on Faith Bridge, and the news came out. He was in his 70s, I think, at this point, that he'd had been, that he'd been David. <laughs> All along, he was engaging in an extramarital affair the whole time. And we were so confused and disillusioned. And we're like, was none of what he told us true? No, it's all true. He was just somehow he was, he was living this divided existence. And I remember we sat there just trying to shake the shock out of our head from it. And, and it was that day Dan and I said to each other, we need to covenant with one another that we're just always going to turn the lights of our souls on to each other so that any cobwebs that might be getting formed in there, we can see them and sweep them out so that we can make sure all our confessions are made in the shallow end of the pool so we don't accidentally one day end up drowning in the deep end of the pool. And I tell you, I tell you <clears throat> and we do that weekly, and I never walk away from one of those breakfasts or coffees or whatever, catch a few minutes when I don't feel um, more joyful, freer, lighter, stronger. It's good. And that's what I want for you. Life, fullness, abundance, liberation, victory. That's what God wants for you. Why don't we talk to him right now about it? Let's pray. Lord, this kind of message can't help but touch a sensitive part in every single one of our souls. No matter if we've just been exploring you, Jesus, and just thinking about God in church for the first time. No matter if we've been walking with you for 20 or 30 or more years because the temptations never go away. The devil never says, well, I'm just going to quit on this guy or this guy. No, he keeps coming back day after day, ever seeking to steal and kill and destroy. Lord, my prayer is that you would give us victory. 
I want to pray first of all. I just want to lead you in all of our rooms right now. Even as we're praying, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna ask you right now to have a moment of confession. Uh, in this instance, not not a loud confession, but just to the Lord kind of confession. I have a feeling that even as we've talked, you've been thinking about something. Probably maybe one or two things came to your mind. Maybe it was this person or this scene or that setting or or this thing. Why don't you just? Confess it like David finally did that day when he said, I have sinned. Instead of pretending, why don't you just say to the Lord right now, I've sinned against the Lord. So that you could move forward. Do that right now in your your own heart silently, quietly. And then... I want to invite you right now to receive his grace, to receive his forgiveness. He says, for it is by grace that you have been saved, healed, forgiven. Not because you went out and did something so good that you earned it. No, because none of us could ever do that. It's because he went to the cross. So would you just say, okay, I'm trusting you, Jesus, that you would forgive me and I'm receiving that forgiveness even now, trusting that you will wash my sins whiter than snow. You receive that right now in all our rooms. And then last of all, I want to invite you in, in your own heart and mind right now. Why don't you just talk about the Lord? And, and I just have a feeling that maybe today is a day that needs to be a day for turning around. That's what the word repenting means, to turn around or to resolve, to say, you know what? I've got to get a David. I've got to quit trying to do this on my own. I can't win this thing on my own. I never win this thing on my own. I've got to have a, Dave, a Nathan in my life. And here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come next week to the, to the Grow Group Expo because I want to I wanna get in a Grow Group. I want to meet a friend. I need a friend like that. Lord, my commitment today is I'm coming back next Sunday. I'm coming to the Grow Group Expo because I want to meet some real people who are in some real Grow Groups. Or maybe you're in a Grow Group already and maybe your commitment right now needs to be, it's time for me to go ahead and initiate and say, hey, You want to be my Nathan? I I need a buddy. I need a pal, a partner, somebody who I could run this Christian journey alongside transparently with. Even now, Lord, I pray that you would bring to mind people or at least the resolution I'm going to move towards finding that person. And by your grace, God, I pray that you would provide it for him, for her. Because you've created us not for defeat, The devil is always about defeat, is always about destruction. But God, you are stronger. Even as we were singing earlier, you're stronger than all of that. And so we turn our hearts, we turn our minds to you, God. I pray that your grace would flow into our hearts and that we would go from here not uh, recoiling, not with our shoulders hanging over, saying, oh, I'm just such a terrible person. Look at all the things. No, but that we would receive that grace and say, okay, it's by his grace that I am standing tall. I have received his grace. I am going to be even stronger as I move forward because I'm going to move forward full of confession, full of transparency. God, my prayer is that you would make us a congregation full of people who are stronger, not on our own strength, but stronger because you are stronger. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just continued our series on the life of David. And today we talked about David and Bathsheba. 
<laughs> um, and so we've been looking through this series at the life of David, and we've seen uh, some victorious moments mm -hmm. in David's life. But today we focused on one of David's struggles, uh, looking at uh, his struggle with sexual sin and temptation. Um, and whether our struggle is sexual sin or some other temptation, we all have them. Sure. And they, everybody. Everybody. And in the life of a believer, it's something that we have to flee from and, yeah. and work through on a daily basis. Let's talk a little bit more about temptation. Yeah. You had some good insights on yeah, that. Yeah, that I didn't have time to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I would give credit to whatever book I was reading, but I can't remember. It was over the summer break, and I, w I, I came upon a portion that I thought was really interesting, and that is the author said, if you distill your temptation down, it is a variation of one of, or both, the two questions that the serpent, the enemy, in the Garden of Eden asked to Eve and Adam. Hmm. Um, one, did God really say, that's where it all started, mm -hmm in the Garden of Eden, did God really say that you can't have? And then the second one, do you think that you really would die? Mm -hmm. Or in other words, you don't really, really think. think the consequences mm -hmm. would be that bad. And it creates doubt. And once you start <laughs> tangling and the yeah. rationalizing <laughs> starts and you can begin to think to yourself, well, God did say it, but surely he probably didn't mean it for me. I mean, that's probably what David, mm -hmm. I mean, David knew God's word. He, he would help to write the Psalms and give us, you know, so he knew God. But in that moment, mm -hmm. obviously he was living a compartmentalized life, sort of like the professor that I talked about at the end of Dan's and mine, who uh, w w somehow was living this divided life mm -hmm. and had decided he might have said it, but he didn't mean it for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And the consequences won't be surely that bad mm -hmm. for me. That's what happens to us all if we're not careful. Yeah. So one way, so we flee temptation, but then we also fight against it in a way of protecting ourselves Absolutely. from it in accountability yeah. groups. That's one yeah. way that we flee is, yeah. is yeah. by sure. having people that speak into this and That's hold right. us accountable. So tell me uh, about how you've seen accountability groups sure. work well. Well, I think one of the, the best tools I've ever seen goes back to the 1700s. One of my heroes, John Wesley, um, who was a, sort of an exacting kind of person and very disciplined, but he wrote out five questions that he would have his uh, people get into clusters, same gender of maybe two or three people, what we would call an accountability group, what he called, what they called back in the 1700s, a band, B-A-N-D. Mm -hmm. And the band, and you can Google it, the, the Wesley's band questions. Um, and I can't recall them all by, by memory, but I can get the gist of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, um, uh, where have you been tempted Mm -hmm. since we last met a week ago. Um, secondly, were you uh, victorious over that temptation? If so, how were you? If, if not, uh, why were you not? Mm -hmm. And that leads to the third one. So where have you sinned since we last uh, met together? Uh, and uh, one or two others, and then he ended it with, have you been entirely honest with us? Mm -hmm. And I think right there, if you need a little template just to go through while you're having coffee or eating breakfast or lunch or you know, whatever, um, those are some pretty good mm -hmm. questions to use today. Because just getting together mm -hmm. doesn't guarantee that your soul is gonna be protected. I'll share an example that actually comes from Pastor Dan. I remember years ago, um, he was in a little group like this with some other pastors back when he was pastoring in Georgia. And one week, one of the pastors didn't show up. And they thought, well, he must just not be feeling well. And, and they didn't think much about it. And the next week he did And they start going after him. You know, where are you? We've missed you. What's going on? Well, soon thereafter, he's out of the ministry. Hmm. And what in the world? He'd gotten himself embroiled in an affair. And he was still, previously, up to those two weeks, he'd been meeting with these guys. 
He just wasn't being honest. Mm. He wasn't answering that last question that Wesley yeah. said. Are Have you been honest, honest completely here uh, with us? Are you still hanging on to something inside your soul? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are there any, uh, we know accountability groups work well, mm -hmm. having people who speak into your life. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other resources um, out there or things that you sure. would? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot, but are there, there any? There are a lot. I, I uh, would mention a couple with credit to our own Mike DeStefano. I was texting with him to make sure I was up to date, I said, so Mike, what is particularly helpful these days? And he said, I would recommend, uh, the, if, if you're in some sort of addiction, particularly of this nature, uh, the Fortify program, the Fortify app, um, it's a recovery program. And then for parents, uh, there's an app called Our Pact. Okay. And we're gonna be installing that uh, with our kids, mm -hmm. uh, our pact, which is a parental mm -hmm. control protection uh, sort of thing, just to, just to help out. You know, we talked about today um, the Kairos conference yeah. that's coming up. Um, as somewhere that you, if you struggled with before, like we see that David, he struggled with this so much, but he repented and he received, even though he had counsel, he received forgiveness just, just in the same way we do if we that's struggle. Right. And so Kairos could be a Oh, great, that's another great step. Uh, a Don't great place miss, to step. that's or a moment. we offer counseling and partner resources yeah, here. So that's right. uh, certainly don't fight this kind of thing alone. Sure, make a call to the church. Mm -hmm. Ask for Beth Ellis. Beth. Mm -hmm. Ellis mm -hmm. is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. And she can connect you to groups and things in her area and as well. counselors, experts. All right. Good. So that was a great look again today at uh, David. We continue talking about David next week. So looking forward to that. Hope you'll join us back here next week as well for Postscript. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.